The pandemic got us into a reflective space and made us look inward to see what we can do for the world at large. As a self-expression coach, I became a catalyst for women and started Vani, a one-on-one coaching program for women on finding their voice, to speak up, to be visible. As a storyteller, I spotted that there were many ordinary people amongst us leading extraordinary lives, making a difference to the world, and they needed to be heard. Thus was born You and I with Rashmi Shetty, where amazing personal journeys with their uniqueness and individuality are showcased. A reaffirmation of the fact, open your eyes wider, the world is far more beautiful when we acknowledge the presence of both you and I. July 1st is National Doctors Day in India and 1st of July 2022 is when India bans single-use plastic. Our guest today is a perfect fit for both. Professor Abdul Rashid Gatrad is consultant pediatrician at the Manor Hospital and professor of pediatrics University of Kentucky, Wolverhampton and Lahore, Pakistan. He is also the founder of WhatsApp. World Against Single-Use Plastic, which is now global and in 50 countries. He has a special qualification in planetary health and is a member of the Climate Change Committee of the Royal College of Pediatrics and Child Health. He is working with the Walsall and Wolverhampton sustainability teams and local councils. At the age of 75, he still works in the NHS, now in his 51st year. For having reduced the death rates in babies, he was made a freeman of the borough of Walsall. For improving access to children into West Midland hospitals, he was awarded an OBE. He has been on various committees and written over 80 papers in international journals and has authored two books. He holds three doctorates, Doctor of Medicine, Doctor of Philosophy and Doctor of Science. As CEO of Midland International Aid Trust, he has delivered medical and humanitarian projects to over 20 countries. In 2014, he was made Deputy Lieutenant to Her Majesty the Queen. Listen in as Professor Getrad shares his amazing journey and what helped him find his purpose. His passion project was SAP, World Against Single-Use Plastic. an honor to have you, Professor Rashid, on You and I with Rashmi Shetty. A warm welcome to you. And seeing the work that you have done just with this beautiful project, but a very timely one, WhatsApp, World Against Single-Use Plastic, such a meaningful one. And at the beginning, I would only like to say that this piqued my curiosity to find out what was little Rashid like to... <laughs> The very meaningful causes that you are fighting for now as Professor Abdul Rashid Gatrad. Can you please share your journey? Okay, I think in a word, what was little Rashid like? Very naughty in a word, okay? Because I used to play a lot of cricket and I used to break, I used to play cricket within the house, break uh, window panes. So I used to have to be paid for. In other words, you know, I used to be punished by my dad, etc. So, yeah, so I mean, you know, at the age of five, when my dad took me up the steps uh, to meet my first teacher, and fortunately, my dad was one of the people that was well respected because he had actually set up the first Asian school, okay, in, 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 in Malawi. And uh, because it was run by the British then, and we didn't have education, so it's the first one that we had. We used to have a Gujarati school uh, where I went to when I was four, four and a half. So going up the steps, and there was Mrs. Fernandez. We had some Goan teachers, fantastic teachers. So he said to Mrs. Fernandez when I was five to say, I would like you to make Rashid a doctor. Okay. And you know what she said? I will do my best. Okay. 
<laughs> little did she realize, little did she realize that at this stage in my life, I would have got three doctorates, doctor of medicine, doctor of science, and doctor of philosophy. Yeah. So that actually come, brings me almost to today. But let's go back to where we were. Yeah. So that's where I went to a school where I thoroughly enjoyed it. I made some lovely, lovely friends there who I still keep in touch with two or three of them. One of them is in London. Other one is in Dubai doing very well. And neither of them are doctors, but I think both of them did much more money than I did. Made much more money than I did. I ever will. Yeah. 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 Wow. Okay. So you hmm. said Malawi. So uh, how did that journey from there begin? And uh, where all did you move or did you complete? Uh, okay. Well, for, you see, what, what happened then was when I got to the age of about 11, in fact, 10 and a half, 11, I actually, uh, there was no secondary education. And, you know, in the Asian culture, everybody wants to make you a doctor or a lawyer. We're talking about, you know, 1900 and, wow, 60. Okay. Where well, I'll make my better better go my doctor of an I think we get it in our head. But um, at the age of 10, 11, there were no secondary schools. No secondary schools. But, you know, there was our teachers were fantastic. Mr. Kambu, you know, Mr. Hiralal and uh, Kudabaksh, all these guys, Mr. Malik, all these guys were very, very, you know, supportive. And sometimes, you know, we as people don't believe in ourselves, yet our teachers do. Okay, so anyway, so there was a scholarship uh, going, and uh, so about I don't know how many hundred people applied for the scholarship, and you know I was so naive, and my uh, we had to fill in a form to say what's your surname. I didn't even know what a surname was, so I asked my dad and said, "What's a surname?" So he says, "Oh, it's actually Gatrad." I never heard of it until the age of ten because I used to be called we used to be called after our father's name. My father's name was Mohammed. So I used to be called Abdul Rashid Mahmoud. So Gatrad, I said, fine. So anyway, to cut a long story short, I went to the exam. Hundreds of people there from all over Malawi. And, and then a couple of months later, our headmaster walks in and he says, four people have been chosen from the whole of the country. And there is a Gatrad from this school. And he actually came into our class and he said, I didn't even know that I was a Gatrad. He actually walked away. So my sister, who was in the same class, said to me, Rashid, it's you. You need to, you know. So that's how it started. So I got the scholarship, went to Zimbabwe, which was Rhodesia in those days. And you know something? I thought I was quite bright at that age and because my dad thought I was clever, but I don't think I was particularly. So when I, when I got there, actually, I uh, they gave me this funny things, you know, which people these days, you know, non-verbal, verbal exams and all that sort of stuff. I didn't have a clue. Did you, you give me about mathematics. I tell you, I could tell you 22 miles timetable or because our Hingora master, you know, taught us these tables like they do in India, you know, just like that. But, you know, I totally failed with that. Okay. And I was put in a class called 1D, 1A, B, C, D. Right. And, you know, my heart sank. But fortunately, this is where moments in time come in. There's a chap called Aziz Osman. Okay, he's a, he's a very good friend of mine, a fantastic cricketer. A national, he was a national hero. And he was doing his O-levels at the time. And I was sharing a room with him. Yeah. He said, Rashid, don't worry. What we'll do is we'll get you into A. Okay. But you have to work very hard. Okay. So because he knew I played cricket as well. And cricket is my passion. Okay. Which I'm sure a lot of Indian uh, Indian. Um, uh, 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 listeners would actually, you know, uh, relate to. So anyway, him and his brother, they both worked hard on me. And I was, I think, the first person to go from 1D to 1A. Because 1D, the future was either you do gardening, yeah, or you do brick playing or something like that. Because this was a mixture of cultures. There were Africans there, Indians there, you know, what we used to call mixed race there. So there were lots of people there. So it's a question of getting skills. So fortunately, I get into A1, 1A. Yeah, a lot of struggles because I wasn't that bright a guy, okay, compared to all these guys, you know. I mean, there was Arvin Nayak there, wow, you know. Mahesh Ranchot, wow, you know. These guys were, wow, yeah. 
Anyway, anyway, so we went through. Our, you still uh, remember their names? Oh my God, they must have created quite an impact. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I also like the young lady there. Yeah, you know? I don't know whether I should tell you her name because she may actually be around. And I, I just fell in love with her, yeah, like you do when you're a teenager. Anyway, so uh, yeah, so you go through your teenage years and all the rest of it. So and we got to got to got to O levels in those days. I did okay in the O levels, and then. Again, a stop. Moment in time, moment for decision. So there were no science classes in those days. And I wanted to be a doctor, remember. How the hell are you going to do this? Now, this is where, you see, apartheid comes in. Because our school, there were no white people there. They're all non-white people. And even if you went to a toilet in town in Salisbury, yeah, for whites, non-whites, yeah. You went to cinema. Whites, non whites. So it's all going through apartheid. So we, we just accepted it as it was. And the apartheid system was such that you actually slow down the, the bright ones, okay, because you don't want bright ones to be running the country in the future. But anyway, so uh, I started doing Latin, French, and economics. So, uh, so, uh, so I did French, Latin, and economics at A level. And, uh, and then I went home, and dad says to me, because dad had just been just done two or three classes in India and was just about could write English, you know, and mum never went to school. So um, so I said to dad, I said, look, I can't be a doctor with this. So he said, we need to send you to England. So we went to see a lawyer and this lawyer said, oh, you must send him straight away to England. This was December. So I come up to England, it's snowing, and this Aziz guy actually comes to pick me up again. By now, he's in London doing chartered accountancy. Can you see how important that chap has played his life? So I stayed with him and his wife at the time. By this time, he got married. And I stayed with them. And uh, I wanted to go to Brighton, do A-levels in one year. I thought, I want to be a doctor fast. Well, he said to me, sit down, young man. Take it easy. Go slow. Yeah, The journey ahead is going to be hard. A-levels is no fun. Okay, Two years, that's what you do. My advice is two years. So anyway, instead of going to Brighton, I settled in London. And then we, I did two years there. But even at the co college where I went in Harrow, um, there, pe people said to me, you know, uh, Rashmi, that uh, I don't think you'll be a doctor. In fact, instead of doing three A-levels, you must only do two. Because my marks in zoology, which I thought was my favorite subject, for some reason, I didn't get enough marks. So I think for listeners to know that, you know, I think it's a journey where I'm not the brightest spark, yeah? But one thing is certain, you work hard, you've got faith in yourself, and you have faith in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay. So I, I was asked to stop doing A-levels at the, at the first year. So I was only doing two A-levels now. Okay. So I did the third A-level privately in my own home and you know we had to dissect a dogfish as a dissection as part of zoology so we used to rent out a, a, a building from a, from a jewish family and jewish people have outside the houses a little thing where they pray so i used to study there as much as i could okay and i used to travel by bus one way to harrow and back just to take me an hour each way. Yeah. So I used to leave at about seven and come back at about seven. Yeah. So that one hour was spent studying physics, chemistry, and all that. So anyway, to cut a long story short, again, I got the highest marks <laughs> that I could get in the whole college. And Leeds University then accepted me. So I went to Leeds University. But uh, money at that time became very tight because the Malawian government the Africanization had taken place now. So we were from one end of getting white rule to a very strict black rule. So we were not getting money sent to our, for our education. So I, my brothers and sisters were coming on stream because my younger brother is a doctor. My young guest brother is a chartered accountant at quite a high flying uh, sort of, you know, management and he's got lots of properties, etc. And all my, all my brothers, sisters are actually professionals. So, so they were coming on stream, and my dad always said to me that, look, if you actually succeed, your brothers and sisters will, okay? So no money coming through, so I had to become a postman to earn just the niceties of life, 
you know, to be able to go out to McDonald's or something like that, you know, to have a nice pair of shirt or something. Okay. So I did that for a short period of time, just before university and soon into university. Yeah, and then I think the journey begins differently because I enjoyed working at university. Again, somewhere in the middle, yeah, I had made some lovely friends. Uh, somewhere in the middle of that hump where you get the majority of the children. Uh, I got a couple of dis- distinctions on the way, but that's just sort of other, other people got them as well. Okay. So once I qualified, that was in 1971, I then went to, uh, went for some jobs, okay? And discrimination was really rife, Rashmi, really awful, okay? And the sort of jobs that we were getting in 1971, uh, for a junior doctor, where the sort of nobody else would want those jobs. Okay, so I remember. I, I, I mean, I just didn't have a job, and then somebody gave me a job in Bradford. Okay, and um, having got that job, I was excited, and then that job actually was given away to one of my classmates who used to happen to be white. Okay, so I lost the job. It was promised, didn't give it to me. Anyway, fortunately, to cut a long story short, I got a job in Wakefield, uh, which is where I met my wife. Yeah. So I impressed her. She impressed me. So we got married uh, a year or two. She too is a doctor? She too no, she's a nurse. She's a nurse, yeah. So so we got married in 1975. Yeah. So we're still married, thankfully. She's still married to me. So I don't know why, but she's still married to me. <laughs> anyway, so we've got married for well over 45 what, years what? now. Drew you to pediatrics, professor? What well, yeah, it, it's actually yeah, it's very interesting. Uh, I actually wanted to be an obstetrician because mm. I really loved delivering babies. Yeah, and that is something that is hugely important. And and in in a sense, in a sense, uh, because when I go to Africa, I'll tell you the story of how how philosophy changes. But I had a back problem, and uh, interestingly. Nobody could diagnose it, Rashmi. Nobody could diagnose it. And I, I, everybody was looking at these x-rays and saying, we don't know, we don't know. But anyway, when I actually became much more senior, I'd look at the x-rays myself. Okay. And I knew what was wrong with me. Okay. And that operation took place in 1988 when I was a consultant. So it's way, way after that. But that's, that's going very much quickly into, into the future. But anyway, here I am, qualified, got job. Lots of jobs here, there, and everywhere. Again, not not with ease. Uh, being, I mean, now you wouldn't go through this, but bullied. Yeah. So there are four doctors, three whites, and me. They would give me duties that went as great, and they would say, "Why didn't you do this? If you do it, they say, why did you do it? You know that sort of stuff." So we took it, and one day actually, I really had it enough. So I actually told this consultant, lady consultant in Doncaster that I am going to actually take you to the General Medical Council, okay, for what you've said and done, okay? Yeah. And she thought this was serious. And then she actually apologized. So I said, I won't accept your apology. What I want you to do is the people where, who were there at the time that you insulted me, I want you to sit there and tell them that you were wrong. Whoa. That's the only way I would accept your apology. What gave you the courage to do that? I, you know, something, sometimes I, I, I was not that sort of a guy, mm. but I think, you know, enough was enough at that time. The question was, do I leave this job or do I now fight back? Okay. Because, you see, that actually discrimination just plagues you right through. Yeah. And, and, and then I, I, I got lots of degrees and diplomas and, uh, you know, all together. I wanted to be better than everybody else. So I got seven to eight degrees, actually, totally, yeah? Okay, over, over the next four, five years. And, uh, and then I'm ready to be a consultant, okay? okay. So, so I go and see a professor. When this entire insulting episode happened and you took the courage to confront it, because most of us have this fear of fear, which stops us from doing what we can do. And when yeah. we really fight the demons within and yeah. go ahead and do the act, the act is not as scary as the thought of the act. 
and uh, sometimes just taking that first step is all it is and the rest uh, whatever happens opens a pandora's box or yeah. a miracle box in your case what box did you open well it's the thing is i think from my point of view nothing very much really because i think i still remained i took a lot of rubbish still from people continued to because i didn't want my career right up to many many few years ago i just wanted my career to go smoothly and i knew i had to have to work harder and you know as uh, abraham lincoln said you know he said uh, i'll always walk forward slowly but i'll run with you but i'll never walk backwards so that actually always stuck with me to say yes i'm also going always going to go forward with this so i'll go slowly but i'll get there okay so uh, so i met this professor and i said look his name was Prof- i can tell you because he's dead now and uh, i said to him he's written a book or two in pediatrics very good books i might say and uh, he said well your color's wrong to be a consultant he said what you do is become a gp or you become a community pediatrician community pediatricians had a very bad name in other words these were asians who couldn't get a proper consultant job or they were psychiatrists asians or they were orthopedics asians or they were gps more and more asians so that's what he said to me so i said okay if i was a white boy what would you do So he said, mm, I would say to you, go away for a year, have, have, have different, you know, and then publish a couple of papers. So I said, yeah, that's what I'm looking for. Okay. So anyway, so I went then to Africa, where I was born in Malawi. Okay. And uh, I thoroughly enjoyed it. Mm. It's a long story. And the person who got me the job was Aziz Osman, the same guy. Oh, because he God. was actually at that Catholic's hospital as their trustee can you imagine how important that person has been in my life he says rashid i'll sort you out okay anyway so i got the got the job but the thing was when i after i got the job because i'm a pediatrician remember okay and i didn't do obstetrics because of my back because you know the heavy heavy things that you've got to wear etc so uh, and you have to stand long hours and i've got a back problem that was operated later on when i was a consultant so so I so said I came back one requirement Rashmi was this that I need to do obstetrics in a big way in other words I've got to do cesarean sections okay oh. now remember I've 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 trained in pedi- obstetrics yes. for 6 months yes. that's where my Doncaster scenario and nightmare was in obstetrics okay yes. so I knew bits about it but I it was 7 8 years gone you know behind me okay and my my peers are actually getting consultant jobs and here i am going to africa to try and get a different experience so i came back and i was in oldham and in oldham a very interesting thing happened uh one day a little child came along okay and i was with my consultant who was at home on duty and uh, somebody rang me up to say oh there's a child that's come in could you please come and see one of my junior doctors because at this time i'm a much higher but not a consultant yet uh so i said okay and this lady was from zambia yeah doctor her name was dr piri so we talk about 1977 okay so all this is happening from 71 to 77 so doctor i said grace i'm just about to go home now and i was not on duty when she rang me she says oh the other registrar when he comes i don't know so i said okay great i'll come in anyway and i saw this child rashmi ji she was completely totally like moribund white as cotton okay and i thought great so i said where did she come from they said the boss has actually sent her in with an ear infection so i said an ear infection can't make you so white she's deathly white in other words she's nearly dying okay so i had to listen to her heart rashmi ji and uh, i couldn't hear her heart at all and she's pale as a sheet but she's alive she's talking her heart i couldn't hear because the heart was covered with blood she had, had a bleed outside the heart okay and she had what we call cardiac tamponade leaving it is not an option because you would die okay so i said i rang up mr dr hilson the boss i said look you know the child you've sent in he went to see the child at home so he did he did the right thing to send it in but for the wrong reason okay so i said look you know mr hilson because he's my boss 
we need to do something serious. I want you now here. Otherwise, her name was Rachel, Rachel Deacon. So I said, Rachel is otherwise going to die. Okay. So he came in. I'd done an x-ray by this time and confirmed that this heart was, instead of that, was that big with blood around it. So I said, uh, what shall we do now? Because this kid's not good. He says, I don't know what to do. So I said, she needs that blood removing from that. You know, there's a heart. There's a, uh, there's a thing around it, which your medical chaps will know about, called the pericardium. So the child had actually bled into the pericardium, sac, into the sac. So I said, look, I've, done, I've seen one procedure done in my life where you stick a needle into the heart and get that blood out. Okay. He says, I've never done one, never seen one. I said, what do you think? He says, go for it. I went and saw the parents. I told them, just expect the worst scenario. Okay. All I'm going to do is I'm going to try and save your baby's life. I cross my six pints of blood. Okay. Six pints of blood. Okay. And, I, and these guys were saying, why? I said, I'll need it because I don't know how much I'm going to get out. Anyway, I did my bismillah, put my needle straight through into the heart, praying that I'm in the right spot. Remember, if I'm in the left, wrong spot, which is called into the heart, then I'm dead and she's dead. Okay. So anyway, so I put some stuff and, and the blood started gushing out. Rashmi. So I thought, crikey, am I actually in the heart or outside the heart? So what I did was I took, you know, this barium, the white stuff you drink. I stuck some of the stuff in a dye to see if it disappears in the body, then I know that this girl is going to die. But if it stays there, that means I'm in the sack. It stays there. And I removed two and a half pints of blood. And I gave this kid six, seven, six pints or so. I can't remember what it was. Anyway. So then it was a question of finding out why she had it. And I never heard of the condition. The condition she had was what's known as Kawasaki's disease. Okay. And, at, and it's a Japanese. The only thing I'd heard of was Suzuki, you know, rather than Kawasaki. <laughs> anyway, so that's what the child had. And it was a new condition that was coming up. Now everybody knows about this condition. Yeah. Where you get this. So anyway, so when the bosses realized that I'd done that, yeah, I got a senior position. Okay. So somebody said, look, this Katrad guy, you must have him. So anyway, so I, around this time, so I became a senior registrar now, ready to go to Africa. But now I need six months training in obstetrics. So whilst I'm on call with Dr. Hilson, I'm training to do operations on women, especially at night, that are cesarean sections, mm-hmm. but assisting them, assisting them. Rather than, because I can't, you know, they, they, they would actually stop the unit, you know, they would close the hospital down. So anyway, so when I went to Malawi with my wife, we thoroughly enjoyed it. Absolutely fantastic. My parents were there. You know, so many people came to see us there. Uh, and I played a lot of cricket. But for the first two or three weeks, no operations. Okay. And then I get a call to say, there's a baby stuck. Professor Gattra, Dr. Gatra, not Professor then. Uh, could you please come in? Sort this out. I said, Marge Baba. Yeah. I've got to use my skills here. Okay. First operation I'm doing on my own ever. I know what to do. Yeah. We started the work at 10 o'clock. I finished at 4 o'clock. In the- oh, okay. Sorry, it took me six hours. I tell you what, there was more sweat on the ground. Then there was blood from the patient. Okay. Yeah. Remember, you're operating on these people where there's no blood as a backup. Yes. Because blood is actually sitting outside, which is a relative. And you know that from being in, being in India. So anyway, so minimal loss of blood. Baby's fine. Mother's fine. I sat down and I prayed. Done. Yeah. First cesarean section, done. Okay. And then I did loads after that. But the confidence came back. Okay. But the beauty about being in Malawi was that I enjoyed it so much I didn't really want to come back. Okay. Because I had a lot of respect. Most importantly, I was playing a lot of cricket because I played national cricket for, against other countries. You see, I used to bowl and I used to be a slip fielder. So so we did that. And then the question was, it was an ultimatum to go back to the UK. So I went back to the UK and all the people that were my juniors by this time had become consultants. Okay. And I'm applying for jobs, Rashmiji, and nobody wants me. 
I've got so much experience. You know, people actually tell me, Rashmi, oh, you're too qualified for this job. You know, somebody's just pipped you at the post. Huh? Okay. And, you know, I used to be with a chap called, uh, I forgot his name, Alistair, Alistair Bromford. Yeah, Alistair Bromford. You know, I went to interviews. I meet Alistair all the time. I said, Alistair, not got there, not got there. And then suddenly, Alistair disappeared. He's got a job. Wow, well done. Okay. Now, I have actually, I've gone through to 10 interviews now. I've produced some papers. I've written some papers. So that's what that professor wanted me to do. I've done it. I went to Africa, done it. I'm still struggling. So what happens now, yeah, people are telling me, going to general practice, going to general practice, you know. My dad said to me, look, you can do it. My mom says, you can do it. My mom had told me when I came to England, better, your doctor ne benega, to wapis kabiniana. Don't ever come back home if you don't become a doctor when you go to London. Huh? Yeah. Because London said, look at that, and look at LRDF. LRDF, yane, London returned damn fools. That's right. So no, what uh, was it with medicine that your dad liked uh, you and dreamt for you to become a doctor? I think it's an Asian thing. <laughs> That's yeah. it. I it's want I want that. my son to be a doctor. Oh, no, yeah. but he, he could have pushed you to be an engineer, a lawyer. Why not? Nay, nay. I think he said no, no. He, he he had plan. Me doctor, my younger brother engineer, yeah, mm-hmm. and the third one lawyer. That's my dad's plan, okay. huh? But it didn't work out that way. Yeah, because I, I had to guide him later on. You yeah. know, said, Papa, yeah. you can't do it this way. I think you've done it to me. It's worked. Okay. But when it came to my younger brother and dad said, you became an engineer. Do you know what he wanted to do? He says, I want to be like Rashid. I want to be a doctor. So we'll be Dr. Bangia. So he became a GP. That was his, his sort of career. So anyway, so I, I did a lot of interviews, you know, and people telling me all these things. But I think... You know, something else, yeah, very spiritualistic, I think I mentioned to you before. And, you know, you believe in it. And you say, well, I've been to Aberdeen. I've been, I'm going down the alphabet, yeah? I've been to Aberdeen. I've been to Bradford. I've been to Coventry. I've been to Devontry. You name it, okay? Manchester coming down the alphabet. Now, I've got an interview in Walsall. W. Okay? Now, M- M6, Joanna, Bellissimo to air, Bellissimo to air. And M6 actually goes from Manchester area right through to, right through to, uh, to, to London area. Anyway, so it was being built. We talk about nine, eight, 1982 now. Okay, so I've been qualified 11 years. Most people become consultants after eight or nine years. So I've been qualified nearly 11 years now and still looking for a job. So a lot of road works, no mobiles in those days, no mobiles, that's important. My wife and I are tuttling along. Do baje interview her, two o'clock interview. We are stuck on the motorway, okay? And I said to my wife, I don't know what we're going to do, yeah? Because my interview is at two o'clock, either going to nickel either, okay? So I said to her, Esa why don't you get out of the car? Yeah, would you bari bari phone jo dena? Were workers, mm-hmm. they used to have big phones to ring up, whatever. I said, Can you go over there and tell them, here number a hospital car, okay, we'll be delayed. Okay, the Baba, to I said, Do you think I'm going to be sitting here whilst your car is going away? Make a karungi. I said, So I said, You are right. Kya karenge? So, Rashmiji, this is where my life changed. Mm-hmm. Life changed at that point. Yeah? Meneka, yeah, kuda. I'm kya karenge. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And look, could, I give look, you, could I give you the answer? Look, yeah, okay. You get me out of this, okay? And I'm just going to change my life for you. For good. Okay. So you know, Rashmi, I don't know how. We got to that interview. With 10 minutes to spare, that's right. I was fresh. I was job. There are some new fresh faces with me. So I got that job. 
Okay, I got that job. Lekin, the problem is, it's a sort of job. It was in a rundown place where the mortality of babies were the worst in the country, worst obstetric unit, worst care of children. Okay. So when I got the job, I went back to my boss and I said, I've got the job. He said, Rashid, just take it. Yeah, I'll tell you why, two reasons. First of all, you've got the job. And secondly, only thing you can do is bring it up because it can't go any further down. <laughs> okay, all right? So the challenge, Rashmiji, was this challenge. I needed to bring the death rate of babies that was 19 per thousand newborn babies mm. below. Just drop it down. Anyway, with God's grace, good team around me, some leadership qualities from me. We brought it down to 9.8 in five years. Congratulations. That's so powerful and meaningful. 9.8 in five years. But in the meantime, I'll do something big. Okay? Something big to start with, and then I'll give my life to you. Okay? So, in the sense that, you know, I'll do a lot for humanity. Okay? Are you okay with talking in Hindi sometimes? Yeah. Okay. Okay, so so I built a big mosque. There wasn't a mosque in in Warsaw, right? and the reason I built that mosque was, you know, there were people in corners, you know, bate with cigarette pite, drugs there. I said, I want this. I want the children of my city, right, to be actually doing something. Mine isn't a religious thing, you know. You can go and pray at home if you want to, yeah. But I want these children to be guided. Okay, and for them to be guided, you need a place, a focus. So I got that built over 10 years. Took me 1984 to 1994. Okay, I raised three million pounds. Okay, for that mosque. So that's that's what happened there. So we built that, sorry, not three million, 1.3 million. It was classed as three million, but we did it for 1.3 million. So that was my biggest achievement. Okay, and the fact that I had actually drop the things and then i think you know then as a doctor lots of things happen like you know you become become examiner or whatever so talking about examiner i i somehow broke the door and got into becoming an examiner for diploma in child health which is um which is a qualification but a lower qualification but i was an examiner wow you know, I'm an Asian examiner. Wow. Okay. I'm a consultant pediatrician, acute, looking after sick kids. Wow. Everybody thinks this guy, you know, he should be a Gora Mujamila. You know, his name was Climo. What be which are a bunch of Climo tells me, how come your color's wrong to be a pediatric consultant? He tells me straight. Okay. I bite my tongue. I said, you just you know, the thing is, your actions should speak for themselves. You know, Kissinger said, if your actions speak for yourself, why interrupt? Yeah, because everybody thinks you're whatever you are. Why tell them how good you are? Because that's for other people to decide. Okay, TK. So, so, so I got the job. I did the mosque. I decreased the death rate of babies. And then I became an examiner. Okay. This examiner was actually... A big breakthrough. Now, for the specialist exam, which is what made me a consultant, you actually need a higher exam. And there were no Asian guys. So I actually stood up. Now, this is the second time I stood up. Okay. And I said to these guys, I said, DCH exam, I'm one of the first Asian person. I was the first Asian consultant in the whole of the West Midlands. And the first Asian consultant as a DCH examiner. Right, and I've dragged a few people in. Yeah, I told them, Why are we not MRCP examiners? Next thing we know, MRCP examiners. Okay, you know what the condition was? We use my hospital as an examination center because it's bloody hard work. Okay, to sort, set up an exam is hard work, but they wanted to teach me a lesson. Okay, I said, Fine, no problem. It'll be fine. So, oh, yeah. so then actually all the Asian people then. Got. So we broke a lot of glass ceilings. 
Yeah, so the, the question here that I want to ask you, Professor, is when you set out on that journey to ask, to question, what is it that you'd like to tell people who have that fear to question? Is it Ooh. something that you have to do in order to get what is rightfully yours? Or what happens? See, in your case, they listened and it moved. What happens if your question is not even heard? I think you have to gauge the situation as to where you are and what you want in life. Even now, there are a couple of things that I could say to people at this stage in my life where I'm hoping that a couple of things might happen, which will give me an extra master key to be able to do what I'm doing. Yeah. So to me, anything that happens to me is giving me a key, key, master key, key. So the Raza Kulja there, you know. But the thing is, you know, doors that God opens, humans can't close. Straight as that. Very true. Okay. And so, talking so I, so, about uh, God and humans, I think the one thing that connects both of them is nature. For a lot of people who don't believe in the presence of God, God, yeah, and yeah. call themselves atheists, or uh, it is that nature becomes a living proof of a power above us, and sure. uh, that is where it is important for us to understand that. At this point in time, especially in the last two years, nature thrived with our absence. No, absolutely, and, absolutely right. Yeah. Yeah. So, where did nature come in such a beautiful journey of yours with children and uh, human beings? Well, the thing is, I think you know, once you start looking at children, I, I've written a book on palliative care for South Asians. So what happens, the end of life of Hindus, Muslims and Sikhs. And I've written another book of caring for Muslim patients. I've written a few books, which are it's like textbooks for, for nurses and doctors. So whilst that's happening, yeah, this is where I think what you do takes you to another step. You see, I, I get invited to be a professor because I had done so much academic work. And by this time, I oh yeah, yeah, I forgot to mention this to you. I quite by chance, quite by chance, I meet, I gave a lecture on differential growth of children. In other words, people were classing Asian children growth, same as English children. And we're talking about 1982, 83, when I was just a consultant. So I looked into this and there was a difference. There was a difference. Okay. So I actually gave a talk at one of the universities to say, look, there's a difference. And this is the evidence for it. So one of the guys comes along to me. His name was Birch, 1984, 85. Whilst, whilst we were in the mosque, remember, at the same time. Okay. So Birch says to me, you know, Dr. Gatrad, some very interesting stuff. So why don't you do an MPhil, Master of Philosophy, MPhil? Okay. So I said, you know something, Dr. Uh, Professor Birch? I don't know. I've got a full-time job, etc." He says, well, it'll take seven years, seven years to do it. Four years later, I sent him a card to say, A.R. Hey, Gatrad, PhD. <laughs> okay. So when I got the PhD, yeah, I then... Four got years? A... But he asked you I did to four... aside seven years? Seven years, yeah. I did it in four years. Oh. Yeah, four years. Because and everything... how did an MPhil turn into a PhD? Well, I, after two years, they assessed it. They assessed it. And they said, would you like to get an MPhil? Or do you want to do PhD? So I said... In for a pound, in for, in for a pound. Anyway, so that happened. So then I got invited to be professor of pediatrics at the University of Kentucky, United States. Okay. And then I got children from there, students from there to come and teach. And then I used to go there to teach. So that's how it became. And then whilst this is happening, remember, I haven't forgotten my promise to my maker. So by this time, I'm working out. This is now 1992. Okay. 1992. Something serious happens. Okay. Somebody knocks at the door. His name is Aslam. Which are, he, was a, he was actually a, a bus driver. Okay. So he comes up. He said, Aslam, I've heard a lot about you. So I was working in Africa because I'd worked there before. And I was working on AIDS to support children with AIDS. Just sort of for Africa. Mm -hmm. And he wanted some help in Bosnia. Okay. So I said, she says, I want to help some people in Bosnia who are blind. And you know how to deal with people because you work with people who are blind in this country, which I, which I was. 
So I said, all right, no problem. So Betja can't change peer. Anyway, since then, it's 20, 80, was it 92? It's 30 years. And he's like my older brother. I talked to him twice today. Okay. Yeah, because him and I work in 23 countries now. So he's Aslam. So, you know, where we had about 15,000 in his charity, we've got 3 million in the charity because of the network that we have created. And then we built hospitals in Pakistan. We've got Patna. We've got, uh, you know, in Patna, as you know, we've got a sewing center with Savita running that sewing center. In Africa, we've got bicycle ambulances. We've got Sri Lanka. We've got uh, wells. And in, we've got in Bangladesh, we've got lots and lots of houses for Rohingyas. In 23 countries, you name it, we've been there. Okay. And then whilst I was in Malawi, coming to nearly 2017 now, uh, what happens? I'm looking at this African girl and I'm looking at her face. She had a rash. So I said to her, I think we can sort this rash out. But whilst I was looking at her, she had cataracts. So I said, she's registered blind. She's walking with a stick. Why? So I had a cataract clinic going at the same time because a team that had gone with me. Okay, so I got her operated on. But whilst I was rushing around, Rashmi, I actually fell down a ditch and broke my leg. Okay, now this was three days into my journey in Malawi. And I was with a team of people there. So I walked on that bad leg for nearly seven days. And I came back and I was ill for five months. Okay, and I developed sepsis and everything else. But the relevance of that is that whilst I was in hospital, I was saying to myself, yeah, like Kyakarin, yeah. You know, I can't actually go to these countries because it's Sri Lanka, Malawi, South Africa, Zambia, Zimbabwe, you know, um, India, Pakistan. Sorry, not India, Pakistan. I've been to. So I said I won't be able to travel. So I need to do something because I need to continue to serve you. That's my promise. So next morning I get this tray with lots of plastic on it. Yeah, everything's plastic. So I saw this program. Uh, that David Attenborough had produced on the television called Blue Planet. Okay. It's all about how plastic is eating up this world. Yeah? And I thought, good God, you know, this is serious stuff. But next morning, I knew what I had to do. 2017. Okay. I am going to work plastics. So I started off the plastic campaign. Whilst now, I'm becoming part-time at the hospital. No, one sec. But what gave you the confidence that uh, because the community was already in place, you just thought you'll take the thought forward with them or uh, you, this this entire plastic thing just resonated with you and so you went ahead? What gave you the courage to go ahead with something like that? Shira, Shira Shmiji, I think to explain that would be not easy. I think to me, it's like a divine inspiration. Yeah. Now, you know, when you have an idea, Right. Like you talk about Gandhiji, for example, and I can't compare anywhere near there. Yeah. Yeah. He's fighting for something. Yeah. He believes in something. Mm -hmm. And slowly he has to convince people about his cause. Okay. And it wasn't easy for him. Yes, it was. And, you know, a lot of criticisms and, you know, a lot of people are like crabs. They want to bring you down. Okay. And because they want to be recognized, but they can't do it. Yeah. So those crabs, either you kill them, mm. yeah, or you tell them you go somewhere else, or you say, join me, <laughs> and you'll become a master crab with me. Okay. Yeah. So there are various, you know, various ways of doing it. So initially, even the friends of the earth, yeah, said to me, but now I was a professor, you see. So Professor Gatrag, uh, what about this thing that you've done? I don't think... I don't think we, we as friends of the earth are a global organization. Mm. Okay. We've not been able to do it. So you're just wasting your time. So I said to this chap, Ben, I said, Ben, yeah, you've never worked with me. All I'm saying is let's do our best. Okay. Because what's up is by this time I thought of the word what's up world against single use plastic. So I said, it's Walsall against single use plastic. But one day, Mark my words, Ben, it's going to be world against English plastic. But I want people like you to be on board, not on board. Okay. One year down the line, 
I've got hold of school teachers, whatever, whatever. Because see, the difficulty I had was not difficult. Sorry, the, the the advantage I had was a lot of the school children were my patients, mostly white people. Okay, so I used to you know get the name messages to the teachers, and mistresses, whatever, whatever. So we had a steering group meeting of teachers. Okay, and then it clicked. Teachers are on behind board. Council is coming on board, and I've got a few other. By this time, by this time. What happened was that there was I was suddenly made what's known as Freeman of the Borough of Walsall. Now Freeman of Borough of Walsall is huge. Yeah. Okay. Because when I was at the Freeman of the Borough of Walsall, uh, a Lord Lieutenant to Her Majesty the Queen came along and he said, approached me afterwards, he says, I've seen all the country work you've done all the, in all the countries. Would you like to be a lieutenant, deputy lieutenant to Her Majesty the Queen? Can't say no. Okay. So I became a deputy lieutenant to Her Majesty the Queen at that point in time. But prior to that, I had just been made OBE, yeah, because of the work I'd done for access of children into hospital. And that access for children is what gave me the, and the fact that I dropped the birth de- birth rate in Walsall, that qualified me for being the being the uh, freeman of the borough, because OB, which was lovely to get from the Queen, that I got in two thousand and two, but in two thousand fifteen sixteen I got the uh, got the freeman of the borough of Walsall, and at that point the the chap came along uh, from the Queen's office. And he offered me the Queen's left hand left hands. So that opened up a few new doors. Yeah. But now remember, I've got WhatsApp. I've got Queen's thing going. And now there's nobody can stop you now. Okay. So then Lord Lieutenant to the Queen, a new one had come on by now. He launches my work, wall solo against single use. And he says to everybody, right, that mark my words, this is going to be world against single use plastic. <laughs> so 2018 that happened, right? And this is where we are five years later. And with, with your Bollywood people that we spoke to earlier on. So, yeah, things have really moved on since then considerably in the last five years. So, you know, the, 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 the operations still take place, which is my charity still goes on. We raise the money, et cetera. Uh, you know, the, my, my clinical work helps support my you know, charity. Uh, my deputy lieutenant work carries on. And my WhatsApp work carries on. So all those four things carry on. So I think, you know, there are 24 hours in the day. Okay. So I would imagine probably 16 hours are spent doing one thing or the other related, related to those four things. Yeah. Wow. I think even just looking at the count of 16 hours, doing all those four things is four hours per thing. <laughs> is so beautifully visually uh, possible and doable for somebody like you. But, you know, at this point, Professor, I would like you to just take a step back. And like Steve Jobs said, look back and connect the dots. And what is the biggest dot in the center for you that brought it all together and <clears throat> connected it to you? One word, faith. Faith. Okay. I yeah, love yeah. woman. I yeah. love woman. I think I think without that and without your feeling that if you if you are totally selfless. And you know, everybody is selfish in different ways. What's in it for me? And I, I can't say that I'm not like that at all. Yeah, there's always, I do things, what's in it for me? Yeah, sure, I'm a human. Yeah. But then when I think you see selfless service, mm-hmm. where there's nothing in it for you, and where people are sitting under a tree, and they don't know, you know, who's providing the shade. Okay. Now that is, when that happens, yeah, you get sukun, you get the feeling inside, which you can't describe, okay? And for that, I think, wow. I, I think I, I, to be able to feel that, you know, it's, it's like saying, you're saying to your mom, you know, mom, I love you. You can't describe what you feel for your mom. She knows, she knows what you're saying. She knows what that word love means. Yeah. Yeah, and that's what I'm talking about. It's that sort of feeling which you can't describe. Professor Rashid, now that you have said how global this has gone, WhatsApp, 
Is there any symbol or logo that world over as a common language because languages are different. So is there Absolutely. any that you use to get all the members together or members understand the language? I think talking about languages, deviating for a minute, uh, during COVID, mm-hmm. you know, the general advice that you give to people during COVID, uh, I was able to translate it into 15 languages because I've got contacts here, there and everywhere. And we sent it in Portuguese, we sent it in Mandarin, we sent it in African language, we sent it in Hindi, we sent it in Urdu. So we did all these things. Yeah? Simple languages, keep away from each other, wear masks, blah, blah. Okay. And our, uh, our uh, Patna place in Patna actually did masks for the poor people, yeah. free of charge, yeah? mm-hmm. supported by us from here. So that's that. But your question actually coming back to the global situation, we've got a website, which is www.wasupme.com w-a-s-u-p dot com and we've also got a logo uh, but international sign is actually this like a w which is world against single use plastic what's up <laughs> so everybody would know that south africa malawi india pakistan you name it what's up yeah. so if you're doing any work for what's up you don't have to have any logos or anything with you Just you can if you, if you do anything to us you say we've today work for WhatsApp, WhatsApp, and then everybody knows that you're part of the journey, part of the family, global family, all, all, all volunteers, nobody gets paid. Great, great work, Professor Dashi. And talking about those indescribable feelings, my next question is taking you to the pandemic. Everyone in the world took a step back to pause, to understand where they are, where they want to go, and nature clearly showed us who's the boss. What did the pandemic do to you and what were your reflections from the pandemic? I think the pandemic itself, a lot of it was negative. I think lots of people died. A lot of mistakes were made by governments. So that's by the by. I think that's nothing that I could control. What I could control was something through my prayers for those people that are suffering. So you can see my central bit is that okay even today now i'm thanking the lord to say thank you for taking this effort away from us please take it away completely even today okay so i think pandemic as i think it created you know problems mental or whatever we've got to live with those things it's created a lot of issues with economics and finance etc which fortunately i don't have a problem with uh, because so, to, so that is not an issue. And we're not talking about money here. Yeah. We talk about time. You know, you, know you, you, you smile at somebody. That's the closest you can get to them. You don't even have to know them. Okay? Yeah? yeah. And it's, it, it's that sort of thing. Yeah? When you smile at somebody, or, you, or, you know, or there's a, there's a you know, in our religion, there's a thing that somebody took a cat across the road hmm. yeah and he went to heaven just for that thing that pleased the almighty so i think you know you don't know what pleases the almighty and i think you know if we actually look at helping humanity hmm. and certainly helping our planet which is what this song is about which is where i met you you know hamari zameen hamari zimedari you know uh, nature ne pukara yeah kudrat ne pukara now, that word from Shankarji, you know, it just rings in my head. Yeah. Nature is calling you. You are actually fighting a suicidal war against your own planet. Yeah. yeah? You're exploiting it. What's going to happen to future generations? So, yeah, I think, I think things have gotten worse with, 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 I think, what's happening with the war, with the cost of living going up in the world. Uh, so some things have gone bad. But I think our focus should not get away from the fact that short term, whatever we are thinking, is not going to work. And that short term, there may be difficulties, maybe more uh, expensive way of living to get there, but we have to get there. There's no choice, Rashmi. There's no choice. Okay. Sure. And it's everybody's problem. It's everybody has got to be part of the solution. The world is so diluted. We've got 8 billion people. And if we say, look, it's too diluted, too many people there, they will sort it out. No, no, no. It's you. 
Yeah, you have got to be centered to it and you have to draw people in to believe in what you're saying. Same thing with plastics. I had to make them believe. And important thing is nobody gets paid. Yeah, I have not got a penny out of my being a CEO over the last 25 years. Yeah, but I've spent hours on WhatsApp. I've spent hours on Middle International Aid Trust supporting these countries. Yeah, but the beauty of it is that my heart is clean, that I have not raised so I've raised a lot of money, but I've not taken a penny. Yeah. And because it's near the south, yeah, you get help from people to say, I like this philosophy. Yeah. And people ring me up to say, Look, there's a pass up there. But that's why I used to go and ask them. A bit okay, they get some up there, I'm going to here. Yeah. You know, so I think, you know, you build up that relationship with people. And then, you know, you can help people and you build up a network globally. Yeah, we talk about globally, we talk about 30, 40 countries. When you've got that sort of network, I mean, in Africa, we've got 22 countries with WhatsApp, World Against Single Use Plastic, yeah, just in Africa. And we've got India, we've got Pakistan, we've got various other places. So, you know, so all of this sort of really comes to a circle. Yeah. So it is enjoyable. I'll tell you one thing. I have enjoyed my life from beginning to end. <laughs> okay. And, you know, I think <clears throat> if you look at it, I pray to my Lord, you know, that uh, it gives me life until my work's done and work until my life ends. And a very good point for us now, for having had such a purposeful, meaningful life, Professor Rashid, what are three life lessons that you'd like to make? us? <laughs> oh, there's so many life lessons. Uh, what I've learned, you know, something. I think first thing, uh, this is not the lessons. I'll talk about lessons in a minute. But I think the most important thing for me has been, it's like a child, and being a pediatrician, I understand this most. You know, you've got to learn to sit, you have to learn to crawl, and you learn to walk. When you learn to walk, you're going to fall down many times. But then, not only are you going to run, uh, walk, but you're going to run. OK, and life is like that. There'll be lots of times that people will push you down or in nature is you're just beginning to pick up. But confidence in God, the inspiration from your parents. Yeah, that drives me. That drives me. OK, so you mentioned about three things in life. Well, I think, as, as you've said, I mean, even just recently, I've got a diploma in certificate in, um, in planetary health at the age of 75. Now I'm 76. So the point I'm making is, you know, there's so much to learn about life. So whoever listens has got to be a lifelong learner. There's always things that you learn that you didn't know. Okay, that's the first thing. The second thing is that I think you've got to be curious. Why is this happening? Why is the world getting warm? Why is the sky blue? What makes the bird sing? What makes the bird fly? Yeah? That's what you want to be curious about. So when you're curious, you learn. When you learn, you'll, have, you'll do something that creates a difference. And that, I think, is important. And the third, which may be probably the most important thing, is to help others and bring them to your level. Okay. You know something? Everybody is born equal. OK, and everybody that I work with, that we work with, is important part of your life. OK, there's the jumbo, jumbo jets going over there. If that one screw is missing, which could be the lady that w cleans my toilet, if that one screw is missing, my toilet's dirty. The jumbo jet's going to come falling down. OK, so we have to respect, remember, help others. Absolutely crucial in success. Powerful words for us to remember and carry forward. Thank you so very much, Professor Rashid, for your time, for sharing such a beautiful life. And may you stay blessed and amen to your prayers for God to give you a cause to work on. Because I think when passion comes together so much for purpose, <clears throat> life becomes that much more meaningful. So uh, that's true. I'll just give an example today, Rashid, you know. There's a very sick child that I saw today, and he's so much better. Yeah, he actually had nasty blood condition. Anyway, so I saw them. They came from far away. They came from Africa. I saw them today. 
and uh, and the beauty was a smile. Yeah. 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 Okay. And I told those people today. Yeah, because I'm dealing with another very sick child in South Africa, okay, who said operated and the gut, complete gut was removed on my, on my advice, okay, and the child is so much better, okay. I might be a consultant, professor or whatever, you know, but the biggest doctor is there, okay. You're guided by him, you're guided by him, okay, and I am guided by him every second, millisecond of the day. That's so true. His hand definitely is on you for the way things are falling in place. Our best wishes. Thank you. It's been an honor hosting you on You and I with Rashmi Shetty. Thank you so much for being here on the show and sharing an amazing life with us. Thank you very much. Namaste. Asalaamu Alaikum. Shashri Kaal. And thank you for having me. With that, we come to the end of this weekly quest of You and I with Rashmi Shetty. Do let us know if you know people who make the world beautiful. Write in to rashmi.thethirdi at gmail.com That is R-A-S-H-M-I dot T-H-E-T-H-I-R-D-E-Y-E at gmail.com Come! Let's explore this amazing world together, both you and I.